Lal Bahadur Shastri Hindustani, Ba Dur Astri, listen, 2 October 1904 to the 11th of January 1966 was the second Prime Minister of India and a senior leader of the Indian National Congress political party. Shastri joined the Indian independence movement in the 1920s and with his friend Nithin Eslavath. Deeply impressed and influenced by Mahatma Gandhi with whom he shared his birthday, he became a loyal follower, first of Gandhi, and then of Jawaharlal Nehru. Following independence in 1947, he joined the latter's government and became one of Prime Minister Nehru's principal, first as Railways Minister 1951 and then in a variety of other functions, including Home Minister. He led the country during the Indo-Pakistan War of 1965. His slogan of J. Jawan J. Kizan, Hail the Soldier, Hail the Farmer, became very popular during the war. The war formally ended with the Tashkent Agreement on 10 January 1966. He died the following day, still in Tashkent, with the cause of his death in dispute. It was initially reported to be a cardiac arrest. Shastri was a Nehru loyalist. Nehru was his mentor and was fond of Shastri. Although Shastri faced stiff opposition from within his party, his relationship with Nehru aided his ascension to the office of Prime Minister. <laughs> Early years 1904 Shastri was born at the house of his maternal grandparents in Ramnagar, Varanasi in a Kayastha Hindu family, that had traditionally been employed as administrators and civil servants. Shastri's paternal ancestors had been in the service of the Zamindar of Ramnagar near Varanasi and Shastri lived there for the first year of his life. Shastri's father, Sharada Prasad Srivastava, was a school teacher who later became a clerk in the revenue office at Allahabad, while his mother, Ramdalari Devi, was the daughter of Munshi Hazari Lal, the headmaster and English teacher at a railway school in Mughalsarai. Shastri was the second child and eldest son of his parents. He had an elder sister, Kailashi Devi B. 1900. In April 1906, when Shastri was hardly one year old, his father, had only recently been promoted to the post of deputy Tasildar, died in an epidemic of bubonic plague. Ramdalari Devi, then only 23 and pregnant with her third child, took her two children and moved from Ramnagar to her father's house in Mughalsarai and settled there for good. She gave birth to a daughter, Sundari Devi, in July 1906. Thus, Shastri and his sisters grew up in the household of his maternal grandfather, Hazari Lal. However, Hazari Lal himself died from a stroke in mid-1908, after which the family were looked after by his brother Shastri's great-uncle Darbari Lal, who was the head clerk in the Opium Regulation Department at Ghazipur, and later by his son Ramdalari Devi's cousin Bindeshwari Prasad, a school teacher in Mughalsarai. In Shastri's family, as with many Kayastha families, it was the custom in that era for children to receive an education in the Urdu language and culture. This is because Urdu, Persian had been the language of government for centuries, before being replaced by English, and old traditions persisted into the 20th century. Therefore, Shastri began his education at the age of four under the tutelage of a Malvi a Muslim cleric, Budan Mian, at the East Central Railway Inter College in Mughalsarai. He studied there until the sixth standard. In 1917, Bindeshwari Prasad, who was now head of the household, was transferred to Varanasi, and the entire family moved there, including Ramdalari Devi and her three children. In Varanasi, Shastri joining the seventh standard at Harish Chandra High School. At this time, he decided to drop his caste-derived surname of Shravastava, which is a traditional surname for all Kayastha families. Topic. Gandhi's disciple 1921 While Shastri's family had no links to the independence movement then taking shape, among his teachers at Harish Chandra High School was an intensely patriotic and highly respected teacher named Nishkameshwar Prasad Mishra, who gave Shastri much needed financial support by allowing him to tutor his children. Inspired by Mishra's patriotism, Shastri took a deep interest in the freedom struggle, and began to study its history and the works of several of its noted personalities, including those of Swami Vivekananda, Gandhi and Annie Besant. In January 1921, when Shastri was in the 10 standard and three months from sitting the final examinations, he attended a public meeting in Benares hosted by Gandhi and Pandit Maidan Mohan Malviya. 
Inspired by the Mahatma's call for students to withdraw from government schools and join the non-cooperation movement, Shastri withdrew from Harish Chandra the next day and joined the local branch of the Congress party as a volunteer, actively participating in picketing and anti-government demonstrations. He was soon arrested and jailed, but was then let off as he was still a minor. Shastri's immediate supervisor was a former Banaras Hindu University lecturer named J.B. Kripalani, who would become one of the most prominent leaders of the Indian independence movement and among Gandhi's closest followers. Recognizing the need for the younger volunteers to continue their educations, Kripalani and a friend, V. N. Sharma, had founded an informal school centered around nationalist education to educate the young activists in their nation's heritage. With the support of a wealthy philanthropist and ardent Congress nationalist, Shiv Prasad Gupta, the Kashi Vidyapith was inaugurated by Gandhi in Banaras as a national institution of higher education on 10 February 1921. Among the first students of the new institution, Shastri graduated with a first-class degree in philosophy and ethics from the Vidyapith in 1925. He was given the title Shastri scholar. The title was a bachelor's degree awarded by the Vidyapith, but it stuck as part of his name. Shastri enrolled himself as a life member of the Servants of the People Society, Lok Sevak Mandal, founded by Lala Lajpat Rai, and began to work for the betterment of the Harijans under Gandhi's direction at Muzaffarpur. Later he became the president of the society. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Independence Activism. In 1928 Shastri became an active and mature member of Congress at the call of Gandhiji. Shastri participated in the Salt Satyagraha in 1930. He was imprisoned for two and a half years. Later, he worked as the organizing secretary of the Parliamentary Board of UP in 1937. In 1940, he was sent to prison for one year, for offering individual Satyagraha support to the independence movement. On 8 August 1942, Mahatma Gandhi issued the Quit India speech at Gawalia Tank in Mumbai, demanding that the British leave India. Shastri, who had just then come out after a year in prison, travelled to Allahabad. For a week, he sent instructions to the independence activists from Jawaharlal Nehru's home, Anand Bhavan. A few days later, he was arrested and imprisoned until 1946. Shastri spent almost nine years in jail in total. During his stay in prison, he spent time reading books and became familiar with the works of Western philosophers, revolutionaries and social reformers. <laughs> <laughs> Political career 1947 State minister Following India's independence, Shastri was appointed parliamentary secretary in his home state, Uttar Pradesh. He became the Minister of Police and Transport under Govind Balab Pant's chief ministership on 15 August 1947 following Rafi Ahmed Kidwai's departure to become minister at centre. As the transport minister, he was the first to appoint women conductors. As the minister in charge of the police department, he ordered that police use water jets, whose instructions was given by him, instead of lathis to disperse unruly crowds. His tenure as police minister as home minister was called prior to 1950 saw successful curbing of communal riots in 1947, mass migration and resettlement of refugees. Cabinet <inaudible> minister <inaudible> <inaudible> In 1951, Shastri was made the General Secretary of the All India Congress Committee with Jawaharlal Nehru as the Prime Minister. He was directly responsible for the selection of candidates and the direction of publicity and electioneering activities. His cabinet consisted of the finest businessmen of India including Ratalal Premchand Mehta. He played an important role in the landslide successes of the Congress Party in the Indian general elections of 1952, 1957 and 1962. In 1952, he successfully contested up Vidhan Sabha from Soran North Kum Fulpur West seat and won getting over 69% of vote. He was believed to be retained as Home Minister of UP, but in a surprise move was called to centre as Minister by Nehru. Shastri was made Minister of Railways in First Cabinet of Republic of India on 13 May 1952. 
Topic: <laughs> Prime Minister of India 1964 to 66. Jawaharlal Nehru died in office on the 27th of May 1964 and left a void. Then Congress Party Chief Minister K. Kamaraj was instrumental in making Shastri Prime Minister on 9 June. Shastri, though mild-mannered and soft-spoken, was a Nehruvian socialist and thus held appeal to those wishing to prevent the ascent of conservative right-winger Murarji Desai. In his first broadcast as Prime Minister, on of June 1964, Shastri stated, There comes a time in the life of every nation when it stands at the crossroads of history and must choose which way to go. But for us there need be no difficulty or hesitation, no looking to right or left. Our way is straight and clear—the building up of a secular mixed economy democracy at home with freedom and prosperity, and the maintenance of world peace and friendship with select nations. Domestic policies Shastri retained many members of Nehru's Council of Ministers. T. T. Krishnamachari was retained as the Finance Minister of India, as was Defence Minister Yashwantrao Chavan. He appointed Swaran Singh to succeed him as External Affairs Minister. He also appointed Indira Gandhi, daughter of Jawaharlal Nehru and former Congress President, as the Minister of Information and Broadcasting. Gulzarilal Nanda continued as the Minister of Home Affairs. Lal Bahadur Shastri's tenure witnessed the Madras anti-Hindi agitation of 1965. The Government of India had for a long time made an effort to establish Hindi as the sole national language of India. This was resisted by the non-Hindi speaking states particularly Madras state. To calm the situation, Shastri gave assurances that English would continue to be used as the official language as long the non-Hindi speaking states wanted. The riots subsided after Shastri's assurance, as did the student agitation. Economic policies Shastri discontinued Nehru's socialist economic policies with central planning. He promoted the White Revolution, a national campaign to increase the production and supply of milk, by supporting the Amul Milk Cooperative of Anand, Gujarat and creating the National Dairy Development Board. He visited Anand on 31 October 1964 for inauguration of the cattle feed factory of Amul at Kanjari. As he was keenly interested in knowing the success of this cooperative, he stayed overnight with farmers in a village, and even had dinner with a farmer's family. He discussed his wish with Mr. Verghese Kurian, then the general manager of Kara District Cooperative Milk Producers Union Limited Amul, to replicate this model to other parts of the country for improving the socio-economic conditions of farmers. As a result of this visit, the National Dairy Development Board NDDB, was established at Anand in 1965. While speaking on the chronic food shortages across the country, Shastri urged people to voluntarily give up one meal so that the food saved could be distributed to the affected populace. However he ensured that he first implemented the system in his own family before appealing to the country. He went on air to appeal to his countrymen to skip a meal a week. The response to his appeal was overwhelming. Even restaurants and eateries downed the shutters on Monday evenings. Many parts of the country observed the Shastri Vrat. He motivated the country to maximize the cultivation of food grains by plowing the lawn himself, at his official residence in New Delhi. During the 22-day war with Pakistan in 1965, on 19 October 1965, Shastri gave the seminal J. Jawan J. Kashan, Hail the soldier, hail the farmer, slogan at Irwa in Allahabad that became a national slogan. Underlining the need to boost India's food production. Shastri also promoted the Green Revolution. Though he was a socialist, Shastri stated that India cannot have a regimented type of economy. The Food Corporation of India was set up under the Food Corporations Act 1964. Also the National Agricultural Products Board Act. Topic: J Jawan J Kizan For the outstanding slogan given by him during Indo-Pak War of 1965 Ministry of Information and Broadcasting India commemorated Shastri ji even after 47 years of his death on his 48th Martyr's Day. Former Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri was one of those great Indians who has left an indelible impression on our collective life. 
Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri's contribution to our public life were unique in that they were made in the closest proximity to the life of the common man in India. Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri was looked upon by Indians as one of their own, one who shared their ideals, hopes and aspirations. His achievements were looked upon not as the isolated achievements of an individual but of our society collectively. Under his leadership India faced and repulsed the Pakistani invasion of 1965. It is not only a matter of pride for the Indian army but also for every citizen of the country. Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri's slogan J. Jawan. J. Kizan, reverberates even today through the length and breadth of the country. Underlying this is the innermost sentiments Jai Hind. The War of 1965 was fought and won for our self-respect and our national prestige. For using our defense forces with such admirable skill, the nation remains beholden to Sri Lal Bahadur Shastri. He will be remembered for all times to come for his large-heartedness and public service. Foreign policies Shastri continued Nehru policy of non-alignment but also built closer relations with the Soviet Union. In the aftermath of the Sino-Indian War of 1962 and the formation of military ties between the Chinese People's Republic and Pakistan, Shastri's government decided to expand the defense budget of India's armed forces. In 1964, Shastri signed an accord with the Sri Lankan Prime Minister Sirimavo Bandaranayaka regarding the status of Indian Tamils in the then Ceylon. This agreement is also known as the Sirima Shastri Pact or the Bandaranayaka Shastri Pact. Under the terms of this agreement, 600,000 Indian Tamils were to be repatriated, while 375,000 were to be granted Sri Lankan citizenship. This settlement was to be done by 31 October 1981. However, after Shastri's death, by 1981, India had taken only 300,000 Tamils as repatriates, while Sri Lanka had granted citizenship to only 185,000 citizens plus another 62,000 born after 1964. Later, India declined to consider any further applications for citizenship, stating that the 1964 agreement had lapsed. India's relationship with Burma had been strained after the 1962 military coup, followed by the repatriation of many Indian families in 1964 by Burma. While the central government in New Delhi monitored the overall process of repatriation and arranged for identification and transportation of the Indian returnees from Burma, it fell under the responsibilities of local governments to provide adequate facilities to shelter the repatriates upon disembarkation on Indian soil. Particularly in the Madras state the chief minister during that time, Minjur K. Bhaktivatsalam, showed care in rehabilitation of the returnees. In December 1965 Shastri made an official visit with his family to Rangoon, Burma and re-established cordial relations with the country's military government of General Ne Win. <laughs> War with Pakistan Shastri's greatest moment came when he led India in the 1965 Indo-Pak War. Laying claim to half the Kutch Peninsula, the Pakistani army skirmished with Indian forces in August, 1965. In his report to the Lok Sabha on the confrontation in Kutch, Shastri stated, In the utilization of our limited resources, we have always given primacy to plans and projects for economic development. It would, therefore, be obvious for anyone who is prepared to look at things objectively that India can have no possible interest in provoking border incidents or in building up an atmosphere of strife. In these circumstances, the duty of government is quite clear and this duty will be discharged fully and effectively. We would prefer to live in poverty for as long as necessary but we shall not allow our freedom to be subverted. On 1 August 1965, major incursions of militants and Pakistani soldiers began, hoping not only to break down the government but incite a sympathetic revolt. The revolt did not happen, and India sent its forces across the ceasefire line, now line of control and threatened Pakistan by crossing the international border near Lahore as war broke out on a general scale. Massive tank battles occurred in the Punjab, and while the Pakistani forces made gains in the northern part of subcontinent, Indian forces captured the key post at Haji Pir, in Kashmir, and brought the Pakistani city of Lahore under artillery and mortar fire. 
On 17 September 1965, while the Indo-Pak War was on, India received a letter from China alleging that the Indian Army had set up army equipment in Chinese territory, and India would face China's wrath, unless the equipment was pulled down. In spite of the threat of aggression from China, Shastri declared, "'China's allegation is untrue." The Chinese did not respond, but the Indo-Pak War resulted in some 3–4 thousand casualties on each side and significant loss of material. The Indo-Pak War ended on 23 September 1965 with a United Nations mandated ceasefire. In a broadcast to the nation on the day of the ceasefire, Shastri stated, while the conflict between the armed forces of the two countries has come to an end, the more important thing for the United Nations and all those who stand for peace is to bring to an end the deeper conflict. How can this be brought about? In our view, the only answer lies in peaceful coexistence. India has stood for the principle of coexistence and championed it all over the world. Peaceful coexistence is possible among nations no matter how deep the differences between them, how far apart they are in their political and economic systems, no matter how intense the issues that divide them. During his tenure as Prime Minister, Shastri visited many countries including Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, England, Canada, Nepal, Egypt and Burma. Incidentally while returning from the Non-Alliance Conference in Cairo on the invitation of then-President of the Pakistan, Muhammad Ayub Khan to have lunch with him, Shastri made a stop over at Karachi Airport for few hours and breaking from the protocol Ayub Khan personally received him at the airport and had an informal meeting during October 1964. After the declaration of ceasefire with Pakistan in 1965, Shastri and Ayub Khan attended a summit in Tashkent former USSR, now in modern Uzbekistan, organized by Alexei Kosygin. On 10 January 1966, Shastri and Ayub Khan signed the Tashkent Declaration. Death Shastri died in Tashkent, at 2 o'clock on the day after signing the Tashkent Declaration, reportedly due to a heart attack, but people allege conspiracy behind the death. He was the first Prime Minister of India to die overseas. He was eulogized as a national hero and the Vijay Ghat Memorial established in his memory. Upon his death, Gulzarilal Nanda once again assumed the role of acting Prime Minister until the Congress Parliamentary Party elected Indira Gandhi over Murarji Desai to officially succeed Shastri. Impact Shastri's sudden death immediately after signing the Tashkent Pact with Pakistan raised many questions in the minds of Indian citizens. The Prime Minister of India going to Tashkent for a pact and never coming back has not been accepted easily by Indian citizens. His health was fit according to his doctor, R. N. Chu, and he had no sign of heart trouble before. After Shastri's death, his wife Lalita Shastri had alleged he was poisoned. An epic poetry book in Hindi titled Lalita K. Anso written by Krant M. L. Verma was published in 1978. In this book, the tragic story about the death of Shastri has been narrated by his wife Lalita Shastri. There are still serious doubts surrounding the nature of his death. His son, Sunil Shastri, asked the government to unravel the mystery behind Lal Bahadur Shastri's death. Raising doubts about the dark blue spots and cut marks on the abdomen of his father's body after his death in 1966, Sunil asked how the cut marks appeared if a post-mortem had not been conducted. When Shastri went to the USSR for the Tashkent talks, he wanted a promise from Ayub Khan that Pakistan would never use force in the future. But the talks did not proceed and followed Shastri's death on the next day. The Indian government released no information about his death, and the media then was kept silent. The possible existence of a conspiracy was covered in India by the Outlook magazine. A query was later posed by Anuj Dar, author of CIA's Eye on South Asia, under the Right to Information Act to declassify a document supposedly related to Shastri's death, but the Prime Minister's office refused to oblige, reportedly citing that this could lead to harming of foreign relations, cause disruption in the country and cause breach of parliamentary privileges. Another RTI plea by Kuldeep Nair was also declined, as PMO cited exemption from disclosure on the plea. The Home Ministry is yet to respond to queries whether India conducted a post-mortem on Shastri, and if the government had investigated allegations of foul play. 
The Delhi police in their reply to an RTI application said they do not have any record pertaining to Shastri's death. The Ministry of External Affairs has already said no post-mortem was conducted in the USSR. The Central Public Information Officer of Delhi Police in his reply dated 29 July said, "...no such record related to the death of the former Prime Minister of India Lal Bahadur Shastri is available in this district. Hence the requisite information pertaining to New Delhi district may please be treated as nil." This has created more doubts. The PMO answered only two questions of the RTI application, saying it has only one classified document pertaining to the death of Shastri, which is exempted from disclosure under the RTI Act. It sent the rest of the questions to the Ministry of External Affairs and Home Ministry to answer. The Maya said the only document from the erstwhile Soviet government is. The report of the joint medical investigation conducted by a team comprising R. N. Chu, doctor in attendance to the PM and some Russian doctors, and added no post mortem was conducted in the USSR. The Home Ministry referred the matter to Delhi Police and National Archives for the response pertaining to any post mortem conducted on the body of Shastri in India. Sunil Shastri, son of the former Prime Minister, called the transferring of application as absurd and Silly joke. He Lal Bahadur Shastri died as sitting Prime Minister. It sounds very silly that MHA is referring the matter of death of second Prime Minister of India to a district-level police. Quote, he also demanded that it should be looked into by highest authorities like President, Prime Minister, and Home Minister. Later, Gregory Douglas, a journalist who interviewed former CIA operative Robert Crowley over a period of four years, recorded their telephone conversations and published a transcription in a book titled Conversations with the Crow. In the book, Crowley claimed that the CIA was responsible for eliminating Homi Baba, an Indian nuclear scientist whose plane crashed into Alps, when he was going to attend a conference in Vienna, and Lal Bahadur Shastri. Crowley said that the USA was wary of India's rigid stand on nuclear policy and of then Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri, who wanted to go ahead with nuclear tests. He also said that the agency was worried about collective domination by India and Russia over the region, for which a strong deterrent was required. <laughs> <laughs> Family On 16 May 1928, Shastri married Lalita Devi who was from Mirzapur. The couple had four sons and two daughters, namely Kusum Shastri, the eldest daughter, Hari Krishna Shastri, eldest son. Suman Shastri, whose son, Siddharth Nath Singh is a spokesman of the Bharatiya Janata Party and Minister of Health, Government of Uttar Pradesh. Anil Shastri who is a member of his father's Congress Party. His son Adarsh Shastri gave up his corporate career with Apple Inc. to contest the general elections of 2014 from Allahabad on an AAM Admi Party ticket. He lost that election but was elected in 2015 as a member of the Delhi Legislative Assembly. Sunil Shastri who is a member of the Bharatiya Janata Party. Vinamra Shastri, the grandson, is a businessman and writes about politics. Ashok Shastri, the youngest son who worked in the corporate world before his death at the age of 37. His wife Neera Shastri was a member of the Bharatiya Janata Party National Executive. Legacy Ramachandra Guha argued that Shastri shared little in common with his predecessor Jawaharlal Nehru. While Shastri preferred peace with Pakistan, writing to a friend after the Indo-Pakistani War in 1965 that the problems between both countries should be settled amicably, he had previously displayed a knack for taking quick and decisive actions during the war. He swiftly took the advice of his commanders, and ordered a strike across the Punjab border. This was in stark contrast to Nehru who in a similar situation in 1962 against a much larger Chinese force, had refused to call in the air force to relieve the pressure on the ground troops. At the end of the conflict, Shastri flamboyantly posed for a photograph on top of a captured U.S.-supplied Pakistani M48 Patton tank. However, in common with Nehru, Shastri was a self-described secularist who refused to mix religion with politics. 
In a public meeting held at the Ram Lila grounds in Delhi, a few days after the ceasefire, he complained against a BBC report which claimed that Shastri's identity as a Hindu meant that he was ready for a war with Pakistan. He stated, While I am a Hindu, Mir Mushtaq who is presiding over this meeting is a Muslim. Mr. Frank Anthony who has addressed you is a Christian. There are also Sikhs and Parsis here. The unique thing about our country is that we have Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Parsis and people of all other religions. We have temples and mosques, gurdwaras and churches. But we do not bring all this into politics. This is the difference between India and Pakistan. Whereas Pakistan proclaims herself to be an Islamic state and uses religion as a political factor, we Indians have the freedom to follow whatever religion we may choose, and worship in any way we please. So far as politics is concerned, each of us is as much an Indian as the other. Kuldeep Nair, Shastri's media advisor from 1960 to 1964, recalls that, during the Quit India movement, his daughter was ill and he was released on parole from jail. However, he could not save her life because doctors had prescribed costly drugs. Later on in 1963, on the day when he was dropped from the cabinet, he was sitting in his home in the dark, without a light. When asked about the reason, he said as he no longer is a minister, all expenses will have to be paid by himself and that as MP and minister he didn't earn enough to save for time of need. Although Shastri had been a cabinet minister for many years in the 1950s, he was poor when he died. All he owned at the end was an old car, which he had bought in installments from the government and for which he still owed money. He was a member of Servants of India Society which included Gandhi, Lala Lajpat Rai, Gopal Krishna Gokul which asked all its members to shun accumulation of private property and remain in public life as servants of people. He was the first railway minister who resigned from office following a major train accident as he felt moral responsibility. The foundation stone of Bal Vidya Mandir, a distinguished school of Lucknow, was laid by him during his tenure as the Prime Minister, on 19 November 1964. He inaugurated the Central Institute of Technology campus at Tharamani, Chennai, in November 1964. He inaugurated the plutonium reprocessing plant at Trombay in 1965. As suggested by Dr. Homi Jehangir Baba, Shastri authorized the development of nuclear explosives. Baba initiated the effort by setting up the Nuclear Explosive Design Group Study of Nuclear Explosions for Peaceful Purposes SNEPP. He inaugurated the Andhra Pradesh Agricultural University at Hyderabad on 20 March 1965 which renamed as Acharya NG. Ranga Agricultural University in 1996 and was separated into two universities after formation Telangana State. The university in Telangana was named in July 2014 as Professor. Jayashankar Agricultural University. Shastri G also inaugurated the National Institute of Technology, Allahabad. Lal Bahadur Shastri inaugurated the Jawahar Dock of the Chennai Port Trust and starts the construction work of Tutakoran Port in November 1964. He inaugurated Sonic School Balashadi, in state of Gujarat. He laid the foundation stone of Almaty Dam during the year. Now the commissioned dam bears his name. Topic: <inaudible> Memorials. Shastri was known for his honesty and humility throughout his life. He was posthumously awarded the Bharat Ratna and a memorial, Vijay Ghat, was built for him in Delhi. Several educational institutes, Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration Musari, Uttarakhand, is after his name. Lal Bahadur Shastri Institute of Management was established in Delhi by the Lal Bahadur Shastri Educational Trust in 1995 as is one of the top business schools in India. The Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute was named after Shastri due to his role in promoting scholarly activity between India and Canada. Lal Bahadur Shastri Memorial run by Lal Bahadur Shastri National Memorial Trust, is situated next to Ten Janpath his residence as Prime Minister, at 1 Mutalal Nehru Place, New Delhi. In 2011, on Shastri's 45th death anniversary, Uttar Pradesh government announced to renovate Shastri's ancestral house at Ramnagar in Varanasi and declared plans to convert it into a biographical museum. Varanasi International Airport is named after him. Lal Bahadur Shastri Center for Indian Culture with a monument and a street is named after him in the city of Tashkent, Uzbekistan. 
Few stadiums are named after him in the cities of Hyderabad, Andhra Pradesh Ahmedabad in Gujarat, Kolam, Kerala and Bhawanapatna in Odisha. The Almaty Dam is renamed as Lal Bahadur Shastri Sagar in northern Karnataka built across the river Krishna. The foundation stone was laid by him. MV Lal Bahadur Shastri a cargo ship is named after him. RBI released coins in the denomination of 5 rupees during his birth century celebrations. All India Lal Bahadur Shastri Hockey Tournament is held every year since 1991 a major tournament in the field of hockey. The left bank canal form the Nagarjuna Sagar Dam in AP is named Lal Bahadur Shastri Canal which is 295 km in length. Life-size statues of Shastri are erected at Mumbai, Bangalore, Vedana Suda, New Delhi, CGO complex, Almaty Dam site, Ramnagar up, Hisar, Vishakhapatnam, Nagarjuna Dam site, Warangal. Life-size bust of Shastri are erected at Tiruvananthapuram, Pune, Varanasi airport, Ahmedabad lakeside, Kurukshetra, Shimla, Kasargod, Indore, Jalandhar, MHOW, Uran. Some major roads in the cities of New Delhi, Mumbai, Pune, Puducherry, Lucknow, Warangal and Allahabad bearing the name of the legend. Lal Bahadur Shastri Medical College in Mandi, Himachal Pradesh. Shastri Bhavans in New Delhi, Chennai, Lucknow. In 2005, the Government of India created a chair in his honour in the field of democracy and governance at Delhi University. See also List of Prime Ministers of India Citations Further reading Topic. External links Why has history forgotten this giant? Lalita K. Anso on N. Wikisource Government of India, PM India Book Review, Lal Bahadur Shastri, A Life of Truth in Politics by C. P. Srivastava Ten Lesser Known Facts About the Second Prime Minister of India